Hi guys, our last week of online learning. Can you believe we've been doing this for so long? You guys have been so awesome. I'm so proud of you. I can't believe we've been able to do this together with the ease that we have. So last unit, quickie one, just a couple ideas to lead you into eighth grade so you understand how everybody got to this new world or what we will call the Americas or eventually the United States, you know, later in history. So the age of exploration, we're now having the ability to voyage and discover new lands. This is because after all those kingdoms of commerce, all those Silk Road trades that were going on, all the Mediterranean opening up again, people had access to better ships. They are going to start to be able to use those navigation tools that we learned about in Greece. And then again, with the Muslims, like the astrolabe and the compass and some of those mathematical map making skills are all going to make us be able to travel but they get nervous at first and they kind of want to stay in your land. So we're going to start to see discoveries of lands they weren't necessarily um, intending to get to, um, but kind of discover along the way by oopses. So first, um, why go and actually do this? I mean, it was risky. I mean, we're talking about getting on a ship with not, you know, the modern GPS systems and things we have today. And this is the 1400s. So, they did want these Asian spices. Again, they've learned about all these trade routes. Many of them you know, are being controlled now by the Mongols. They don't feel like they can control lands around it. So the ship areas made more sense. Religion too was an influence. They wanted to convert others to the religion. They would send missionaries out to these foreign countries. Um, they would say they were trying to do it in a very loving way of bringing the religion, but often it led to conquering and some brutality with it. Um, but they were kind of using the religion as uh, one of their focuses. Technology, again, was back in the lives of Europeans. You know, we had that freezing of advancement in the Middle Ages, opens back up with Renaissance. And then all of a sudden, these things that we knew from Greece and Rome and, uh, and other lands and had been further even developed as time went on. So we have that astrolabe. Remember, that's the one we can line up and um, gives us direction of the sun the compass to sail in the directions we want. We had more accurate maps. Um, they could sail port to port without having to always stay along the coast as time went on. Um, but obviously you have to stop along a coast eventually to get more resources um, that you may need. Um, their better shipbuilding methods were super important. The Portuguese are gonna build ships called caravals. Caravals are gonna for the first time used triangular sails instead of what had been used before were these large square ones. So when you have a triangular one, it's easier to change direction and go with the um, against the wind if you needed to. And they before um, only had um, oars, but now we have oars and rudders. So think of a rudder as like a tail on a dolphin. You know, if you've ever watched a dolphin swim, it kind of shifts left and right and it makes it easier. So now we only needed maybe five or six people to shift the rudder to change our direction. Before we had hundreds of slaves in the bottom portion of the ship. And if we wanted to turn right, all the slaves on the left would heave ho, heave ho and move their oars. And then they would wait and then they'd get in the right direction and then they'd have to go in sync to go forward. So steering and turning was a big deal. Okay. But these caravels are going to be one of the biggest things that are going to lead us um, into the age of exploration. Now it became a little bit of a competition. First in out of the gate was the Portuguese. Now it's one of the smallest countries. It's just a little portion of Spain, but it's on the West coast on the Atlantic, on the port. So obviously they have a lot of resources that made them be able to be good with ships. Um, Henry the Navigator or Prince Henry was um, really motivated to make Portugal very successful at the sea. He first knew that education was the key. He builds an observatory where we can study the stars and the placement because obviously that helps with direction and operating our astrolabes and things. And then his navigation school is going to teach these sailors, how to actually use the maps and use the equipment and kind of problem solve different events. He sent sailors first to just go along the coast of Africa and establish trade with those areas. We're going to discover those West African kingdoms. Remember, they have those very, very valuable trade goods we were talking about in this unit seven, gold, salt, and slaves. So they're going to definitely take uh, their time uh, through that African coast to trade. 
Then um, Portuguese first sent out Bartholomew Diaz. He gets all the way down Africa, gets to the southernmost tip of Africa, and he goes to an area of land called the Cape of Good Hope. Vasco da Gama goes next. So he follows Diaz's path, but he wants to go even further. Because remember, the goal is to get to the east. So that, in their mind, was India or China. So he goes around that Cape of Good Hope, which is extremely dangerous. Um, and he goes into the area that is what we consider the Indian Ocean. And then he gets that direct sea route to India. So he's the first to make that Eastern trade route successful. So here's Vasco da Gama's. Okay, you can see he has to go back. So once he goes that land, they had to find, you know, routes back. You can't always take the same route back because there's different kinds of wind and different kinds of tides and um, currents with the oceans that push you in different directions. So next up for Portugal was Ferdinand Magellan. He keeps sailing even though they were running out of supplies. He is so um, not real loved by his people on his ship or his crew. Um, he pushed them kind of to the furthest limits they could. They were running out of supplies. He wanted to be the first to circumnavigate the world. Do you see that word circa in the beginning? That's meaning like circle or all the way around. Uh, and he wanted to go west to get all, to the east. So he is going to sail what we consider to be around what now is South America. It's a very, we now call that the Straits of Magellan. He was the first to reach that point. And then he's going to go all the way around through um, these Indonesia, different Asian uh, islands in these areas. And then he will actually not finish the journey. Right around here, um, there, there's varying stories, but he was the one who... Uh, was leading, but his, again, his crew wasn't fond of him and he doesn't make it past those islands. His crew had to finish to get home. So they were able to persevere and do that. There's a couple stories. Um, the crew told the story that the native populations of the islands, when they stopped to trade, uh, killed him. Uh, there are other stories that he was uh, jettisoned from the ship, meaning they threw him off <laughs> and then they could claim that he's, you know, washed up shore on those islands. So there's not really a, a true story because I'm sure, and, you know, obviously we can't ask for a Nan Magellan and the crew wasn't going to speak either about it. So the island of um, Makatan is where he was killed um, and his crew will be the first to circumnavigate the world. Then um, Spain is going to get in the race. Now, ironically, not from a Spanish explorer, but from a Italian explorer. So Christopher Columbus, many of you have heard of him, especially since we have Columbus Day, which is pretty highly debated now. Uh, he's Italian and he wants a shorter way to get to Asia, but he wants to go west through the Atlantic. So not the Southwest route, that Magellan took, but more Northwest. So he's told by the Spanish mar monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, that they would fund his journey because Italy had no desire for this, you know, massive trade um, going on on the ships and exploration. They were controlling all that Mediterranean trade and doing just fine financially. He was promising that he would find gold in the new world. He was promising he would find new land and be able to convert, you know, hundreds of natives to Christianity. He did not realize that he had discovered a new land when he actually came across what we kind of consider um, the um, Caribbean islands that he's going to land in. He'll call them the West Indies, well, referring it to being India. And he will not even be kind of given any kind of magnitude of his discovery until after his death. And to be honest, a lot of his reports about his discoveries were heavily, heavily embellished slash lies. So Christopher Columbus is an interesting person because many people have been taught through the years, you know, all the cute little stories, you know, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, yet he sailed the ocean, yes. But when he came to the land, he's going to just utterly destroy the Tano Indians and take out the entire populations. There's stories of him and his men cutting hands off if they didn't come back from gold from the mines and doing horrible damage to um, children. Okay. 
Conquest of New World. Spanish explorers called America the New World. Conquistadors, that means Spanish for conquerors. And they're going to claim land in Spain. So Spanish is now, Spain is now in the race. Portugal was the leader originally uh, with their education and their navigational tools, but now Spain's going to get in the race. And they're going to go for more conquering than necessarily making better routes. When they arrive in what we consider South America in the early 1500s, they're going to go a little more Central America for Mexico with the Aztecs, and then down into Peru and conquer the Incas. Spain wanted their gold. They wanted to convert them to Christianity. They obviously had more, um, they had rifles at this point, uh, and the Spanish quickly conquered these tribes. Now, these tribes had been living with their own hierarchies and their own economic system and trade for a long time. And now they're going to be what we consider kind of oppressed by the Spanish populations. Many of them died from new diseases because they did not have the natural immunities that were for simple things like smallpox or, um, you know, different viruses. So many of them just from natural interactions with the Europeans died. Uh, and there was also, uh, we see large parts of, you know, Southern North America, Central America, and South America having huge Spanish influences. The Spanish language is speaking, spoken in many of those countries or different dialect variations of it. We have um, even a kind of institutionalized or long-term effect has been that we still see a divide between those native populations and those that are Spanish descent. Those that are of Spanish descent in these countries, even today in modern times, are usually those that are more educated, wealthy, and of the higher status. Those that are maybe servants in people's homes or lower laboring jobs are usually those that have descents of being an Aztec or an Incan or other uh, native tribes of the land. So now England and France, they don't wanna be left out of this competition in this race. So both England and France, again, are on a Western coast. So they um, were gonna have to find a new route, they thought. They didn't want that Southern region that Spain had already claimed. They weren't gonna go into Africa initially because of port like Portugal did. They were gonna go to Northwest path and go into North America to Asia. Unfortunately, they didn't know that there's a big block of land called Canada that's pretty icy and difficult to travel through. So they're just gonna claim the land and the country instead. So now it became them not a route, but fighting kind of with Spain to claim different lands. If we think of French territories, we see some influences in our, our world today. You know, we have Quebec and um, Canadian uh, provinces that have French language and French influences. Uh, we also had some French claims in this, down the Mississippi River. So we see a lot of French influences in New Orleans, Louisiana. You know, it was named after their King Louis and it was has some French, heavy French influences. The whole Creole dialect that's kind of down there is a combination of the island people that were brought in from the Caribbean to be slaves and work and the French influences as well. So the language they even uh, spoke became a merging of those two cultures. So English sailors like Sir Francis Drake were kind of the pirates of the sea. They stole treasures from Spanish ships. Uh, Spain gets mad, and so obviously there's, again, some, some conflict between Spain and England. All right, when you're looking at this on your own with the slides, there's a fun teacher music video here. He did it to a Jay-Z song, so it's pretty cool and recaps a lot of the information. So make sure you take a minute to go look at that when you have your own time when you're looking through the slides. It brought, um, there's now a new world view. We know more and more about geography. We know that uh, you know, there was the idea that Europe was it. Once you went west, nothing else was there. North and South America weren't on maps until the late 1400s. Um, we also, you know, there was the, the really the concept of the earth being flat versus round, that that's kind of a misconception. Most early historians before Christopher Columbus were aware of that. Um, but just having more accurate maps and more proof that actually the Americas were the separate landmass. They weren't just a portion of Asia. Um, having that potential for wealth, kind of going again more with that colony concept, not conquering land that's necessarily adjoining to me just to have a 
big, massive piece of land that I really always can't control. I'm going to have colonies that are smaller territories. They might be distant. And I'm going to actually put my people in charge of them. So I'm not going to run the whole place myself if I'm the king of Spain, but I'm going to send a viceroy or a governor and their representative that has to relate directly back to me and give taxes to me. And they're going to actually run the colony. They're going to handle disputes. They're going to handle um, setting up the trade networks. They're going to handle kind of policing that area, but they ultimately have the support and economic support of that, that mother country. So we are now coming into the new world. So tomorrow we'll talk about some new goods and things that are going to be exchanged. There are, you know, 50 or so different explorers we could credit for making different claims in different areas. If we were in our normal year, we'd be doing, we'd be at school right now prepping for our debates where we would be pitting our different explorers against each other to see who would make it to our final rounds as being the best explorer in the, in the new world. And you guys would be showing me your debate skills. Obviously, that time is, is gone from us, but um, this is important to understand because when you get into eighth grade, you are starting with the U.S. colonies and why French colonies are where they are and where Spanish colonies are where they are and where the English and how England's going to take over and get main control of our 13 colonies. So you need to know this information. Um, I hope you uh, listen to the music video on your own. You have a Google form to complete to answer questions please leave the tab with the slides available for you to look at i want you to get a good score on it i want you to do your best on it this is one of your last couple grades so we have today and then tomorrow you'll have an assignment similar to this i'll read through we'll talk about some notes we'll do a google form and then you'll have an extra credit opportunity on thursday and that'll also be your opportunity to turn in any additional freebies you may have all right, so I'm excited for, you know, kind of a finale to this. I wish it was a different way. Um, we have some fun activities. Hopefully you'll participate in this week uh, with our seventh grade virtual field day. And, um, you know, we hope to uh, see you next year when you're big eighth graders. All right, bye guys.